Hi, and welcome to AMSC's Electrification and Grid Modernization for Future Loads, with me, Max the Superconductor. Since 2005, electricity consumption in the U.S. has remained relatively stable, even though there are more ways to use energy than ever before. So why is that? It's primarily due to improved energy efficiency in the products we use every day, which has been really great for the environment. However, with soaring sales of electric vehicles like Tesla's, the power grid will experience unprecedented growth in electric loads. So if we look at electricity consumption again, here is the flattening from the energy efficient products. But if we model for new loads caused by electric vehicles, they represent a huge disruption. So new electric loads are increasing, but the question is, how can utilities prepare for this new grid? Traditionally, for a new load of this size, a whole new substation would have to be built, which includes land acquisition, permitting, equipment, construction, and all of the disruption that that causes. But we would like to introduce you to the magic of superconductor systems, or as we at AMSC call it, the Resilient Electric Grid, or just REG. REG systems allow utilities to network our existing power grid infrastructure, allowing for the distribution of electricity to be more flexible, safely managing emerging loads. Also, if aging or damaged equipment fails, that section of the grid can be backed up by connected substations, thereby increasing the entire system's reliability and resiliency. Also, REG systems are much more compact than conventional cables, which means much less disruption to the community. Going back to that urban example from before, REG systems could deliver large amounts of power in a manner that only requires a small substation be built, or avoid expansion of existing substations completely. Just think of what your community could do with all that extra green space. REG systems are much more attractive than conventional solutions in that they reduce or eliminate new substation costs, reduce construction required, simplify permitting, lower the overall project risk, and add reliability and resiliency to the grid by networking our infrastructure. Together, this results in less community disruption while making REG-based solutions more economical. And there's so much more that REG can offer. Please visit us at amsc.com for all the exciting benefits of our resilient electric grid system. Just type in REG in the search bar on the homepage to start. Thank you for watching. I'll see you there. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tech Talk 33. Happy New Year. This is our first Tech Talk of the year. Today, we will be talking about the Chicago REG project. If you recall, we had Mike Ross from American Superconductor with us uh, two weeks ago, well, maybe three weeks ago on Tech Talk 31 to talk about superconducting cable solutions. So this is an extension of that uh, presentation that Mike uh, gave us uh, a few weeks ago. Don't forget, at the end of this presentation, request um, a PDA certificate from us. We can give you some professional development hours for this. Um, either email myself or Mike or Matt and uh, we will get that presentation over to that, that uh, certificate over to you. Um, also questions, please uh, in the chat box ask questions and uh, we will get those questions answered at the end of the presentation today. Uh, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button and also share with your colleagues this uh, Tech Talk sessions. Uh, we are looking to increase our participation in the Tech Talks. Uh, so, and also, don't forget what NEPSI does. NEPSI manufactures metal closed capacitor banks and harmonic filter banks at the medium voltage level. We are owned by American Superconductor, who produces STATCOMs, the DVAR STATCOM, the VBO STATCOM, and also superconducting power cables. That's the topic of today. So with us today uh, is Daniel Bronsman. He's the manager of transmission line engineering at ComEd, and I'm told uh, just today that he's uh, change positions. He's now chief of staff. And also with us is Michael Ross, managing director 
of the uh, superconducting power systems at American Superconductors. Uh, so hello Mike and uh, hello uh, Dan. Uh, maybe perhaps you guys can introduce yourselves first before we get on with the presentation. Sure. Uh, thanks again, Paul, for the opportunity to uh, talk on these tech talks. And Dan, thank you very much for uh, for joining us as well. Um, so my background is uh, uh, transmission planning in the in the power sector. I've uh, been with AMSC for 20 years, and I'm currently uh, the managing director of our uh, superconductor projects for utility and industrial applications. And I'm also the uh, project manager from AMSC side uh, for our project that we're currently executing with ComEd. Great. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. This is uh, Dan Brodsman with ComEd. Uh, I've been with ComEd for a little over 32 years, uh, a lot of engineering uh, positions as well as other uh, support positions throughout my tenure at ComEd. Uh, as the manager of transmission line engineering, um, I had the pleasure of really working on uh, our solution of getting superconductor cable uh, deployed uh, into Chicago. Uh, and as I, I always like to note, this is the, the third permanent install of a solution like this in the world. So this is a very unique opportunity. Um, as was mentioned, I just recently did change positions. I am now chief of staff to our president and uh, CEO, uh, but they're still very much involved in this project as we go forward. And uh, thanks for having me, Paul. Well, thanks for coming on, Mike. Thanks for coming on, Dan. Uh, we look forward to uh, this tech talk. Great. So let me start off with uh, the legal ease slide. Um, a large statement of legal ease, uh, just as you would expect uh, with any uh, stock that you would buy. Um, there's always legal jargon. You can you can read that at your leisure. I'm not going to read that to the to the folks uh, on the call. But what I do want to share with you is a little bit of what ComEd is and where ComEd fits in the utility uh, industry. So ComEd is one of the companies that make up Exelon Utilities. Uh, we're based in the northern third of Illinois, serve the metropolitan major city of Chicago, but we also have uh, utilities out on the East Coast, uh, Pico Energy that serves Philly, uh, Baltimore Gas and Electric serving Baltimore, and then the PHI uh, companies of uh, Potomac Electric, Atlantic City, and Delmarva that serve uh, most notably um, Washington, D.C. So overall, Exelon has about a $10 million or 10 million customer um, service base covering over 24,000 square miles. So a very large entity. ComEd represents about half of that in terms of uh, any one of the metrics that we look at. Go a little bit deeper into ComEd. Uh, we have 4 million electric customers that we serve, um, a little over 6,400 employees. You can see our service territory. Uh, peak load, uh, you know, it's been a number of years since we've set a new peak, uh, but there was our, our peak back in 2011. Uh, and then the stats on circuit miles that we have and substations we have. So just a little bit of a background on what ComEd is uh, and where we fit. And with that, I will turn it over to Mike for a little bit of AMSC. Yeah, so um, AMSC, so our, um, our in, in addition to uh, being partners now with, uh, with NEPSI, uh, we do have two main uh, core uh, products that we focus mostly at the utility sector. Uh, we have uh, power electronic equipment, um, so those uh, those include uh, control systems and uh, and inverters and controls that go inside uh, wind turbines. So we have uh, a number of uh, wind turbine customers around the world that we supply power electronics for those uh, those wind turbines. Uh, and then we have uh, Staccom devices. A, a Staccom is a power electronic voltage regulation device, um, and in this case for the utility sector. Uh, we have two different versions of our Staccom. One of them is aimed at the transmission sector, which is what our uh, DVAR uh, Staccom uh, for transmission voltages and very large uh, wind and solar projects, as well as our uh, distribution class Staccom, the DVAR VVO, which is focused more on uh, power quality and uh, the help helping integrate uh, rooftop solar and small wind and, and so on to the grid. 
Uh, on the superconductor side of the business, uh, what we're going to be talking about today is uh, the resilient electric grid uh, solutions, which are, are based on superconductor cable technology, and we'll go over that in some detail today. Uh, and we also do have uh, superconductor programs that are aimed at the, uh, the U.S. Navy uh, that are uh, defensive uh, systems to help uh, protect uh, U.S. Navy ships uh, as they're out uh, in the world. Uh, the next slide, I believe we're going to move into the, uh, the project uh, uh, to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, superconductor cables uh, specifically and, uh, the, and the purpose of them. Um, so the, one of the main things that we're trying to do with superconductor cables and, and one of the key uh, purposes of the project in Chicago with ComEd is to improve system resiliency and reliability. Um, and we want to do that using this technology in a way um, that creates some advantages over what some of the technologies that are currently out there. Uh, so some of the key features of the technology we're going to talk about today is that this can be applied to improve power system resiliency and reliability while avoiding large acquisitions of, of land for new or, or expanded substations, particularly in, in urban areas. Uh, we're trying to help utilities improve their reliability without building large-scale uh, transmission circuits and, and try to give some options uh, to utilities on, on how they can deal with bulk power transfer in, in urban areas. Uh, we're trying to do this in also in a way to, to minimize the impact on the public uh, during the installation of these infrastructure projects. Obviously, large uh, utility projects can be very disruptive to traffic and, and other things, and, and particularly in, in urban areas like Chicago, that can be a, a major cost and a major risk and a major uh, problem with, with these types of projects. Uh, in the same way, uh, we're trying to to uh, help with options for rights of way. Uh, in urban areas, it can be difficult to find appropriate rights of way for new uh, places to move bulk power around. And we're trying to help with that. Uh, siting and permitting. Uh, again, uh, we're, we're looking at this technology as something as a new tool for utilities. Uh, that will make aspects of, of siting and permitting easier. Um, and then uh, some, some interesting characteristics of the technology is that they don't uh, inject uh, electromagnetic fields or EMF uh, into the system, uh, which has some advantages, as, as well as avoiding the use of uh, environmentally hazardous materials like uh, mineral oil or um, SF6 gas, which are two, two devices. Uh, uh, materials that are commonly used in conventional utility equipment uh, that's not used in this technology. Uh, the next slide just kind of gives an overview of, of the superconductor cables. So uh, what we're looking at in this slide is a uh, cutaway of, of a superconductor cable uh, of the type that we're, we're installing today in Chicago. Uh, the cable is special in that it is a, a three-phase cable. Um, so what you're looking at in the, on the top uh, right-hand side of the slide is, is a cable where uh, phase A, phase B, and phase C are all combined in a single cable. Um, the superconductor material is that um, uh, silver-colored uh, material that you can see in the middle of the cable. And those three um, layers of superconductor material are wound around each other in a concentric formation um, so that all three phases can fit in this single cable. Uh, the cable then uh, uh, is able to carry, be, because a superconductor material is able to carry a tremendous amount of current uh, in a small area, we can get up to uh, 4,000 amps per phase, all three phases in a single cable. Um, and what that does is make the ability to move that amount of current, that amount of power in a much smaller space. Uh, so the, the picture in the bottom right hand corner is trying to give an idea of how we can replace many, many conventional cables with a single superconductor cable. Um, so 15 or so uh, uh, conventional cables can be replaced with a single uh, superconductor cable. And, and that's really where the majority of the benefits that we were talking about previously come from, is being able to move really large amounts of power in a very small space. Uh, one of the key uh, uh, aspects of that as well is that we, we cool the cable internally uh, with liquid nitrogen. So in, again, in the top right-hand corner, looking at the cable design, uh, we can run liquid nitrogen down the center of this cable and, and around the outside to keep it cool. 
uh, to take advantage of the superconducting uh, properties. And uh, the, the beauty of that is that liquid nitrogen is very uh, environmentally safe. So 78% of the air that we're breathing is nitrogen. Uh, if you were to spill uh, liquid nitrogen on the ground, it simply evaporates and becomes air. Um, it's as environmentally friendly and, and, uh, and non-toxic as a, as a material can be. Uh, so the advantages of, of cooling the cable with uh, liquid nitrogen is not only is it non-toxic and environmentally friendly, uh, but also it creates a, um, uh, a situation where the cable is not injecting heat into the atmosphere, into the environment. So one of the major problems with conventional cables is that when you install them, or one of the major challenges, I should say, is that when you install them, they, they do generate heat. When you run current through a conventional cable, it gets warm, uh, that heat needs to be dissipated, and uh, that means you can't bury the cables too deep, you can't put the cables too close to each other, uh, otherwise they will, uh, they will, will uh, derate each other. Uh, with superconductor cables, that issue goes away. Um, so, so between those those characteristics, the very very high current transfer capability, uh, so the very small cross sectional area, uh, the internal cooling, um, th those are what draw are driving me many of these uh, advantages associated with smaller spaces and um, and easier rights of way. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about more about how that works in the next slide. Um, so so how can we improve the reliability of a power grid? Uh, with a cable like this. And what we're doing in, in Chicago and, and looking at in, in other urban areas is interconnecting uh, transmission substations together with these superconductor cables at the distribution side. So uh, in, a, in a typical envi urban environment such as Chicago, you'll have many substations. Those substations are serving various parts of the city. And at the transmission level, 69 kV, 138 kV, and so on, uh, they are interconnected in a reliable way. You'll, you'll have uh, N minus two uh, level of redundancy, meaning you can lose one or two transmission lines uh, without any loss, but, but each substation itself is serving a distribution system that is local. So if you lose an entire substation, all of the transmission sources to one of the substations or all the transformers at that substation, uh, you do have the potential for for an outage. So what we're suggesting is is add a layer of redundancy at the distribution level and interconnect these substations together using superconductor cables at the distribution level so that you create another layer of, of redundancy, another layer of backup to the transmission system. And that in turn gives you a, uh, a level of reliability that's otherwise much more difficult to achieve. You would need to build new substations, build new transmission lines uh, to achieve the same level of, of reliability. And as we discussed, the superconductor cables are much more compact, easy to install, and less disruptive uh, than, than those other approaches. So, hey Mike, this is, so the other thing I would add to this that really jumps out from this screen is you look at the multiple transmission voltages so because you're connecting this at a distribution level, you are able to interconnect different high side voltage stations. Now you can't network them, uh, but you can have uh, an energized cable between them to share. The other large advantage of this is the connection at the station is a, is a breaker position, that's all. Uh, like any other 12 kV uh, distribution circuit would have coming out of the station. If you were to bring transmission into these stations, you would need to put transformation in order to transform that new high voltage transmission voltage down to your distribution level. That's the real estate um, consideration that is monumental in looking at siting these in urban areas where you don't really have real estate in existing stations and the acquisition of land to either expand or at a new station is very, very costly. So one of the other huge advantages of what this cable can do at a distribution level connection. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And another way to perhaps think about it is uh, at each of these substations, you have spare transformers. There's one or two spare transformers at each of these substations that can be used, you know, if you have an outage at that local place. 
uh, in today's world. But if you can interconnect the substations at the distribution side, uh, you can effectively use the spare capacity of those transformers at one station to support load at another station. And, and as, uh, as Dan mentions, that's, that's done in a way that you can mix voltages, so to speak. So you can use a, a spare 138 can, uh, transformer at one station to serve a, a, um, a load that would normally be served from 69 kV at another station. So that it's a, a, you know, a, a way to, to improve that level of reliability in a, way, in a manner that uses as little space as possible. So I think the next slide talks a bit about uh, resiliency, and I think I'll hand it over back to Dan to talk about ComEd's perspective on on what resiliency means. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So, it, you know, there are lots of definitions of resiliency. In fact, that's one of the challenges in the industry. There is no common resiliency definition. However, with that being said, um, they all kind of hit three major buckets, the withstand, the recover, and the survive. Um, so whatever words they use, whether it's, um, you know, DOE um, or any of the other, you know, NERC definitions of what resiliency is, they all hit these three high level buckets. When you look at the superconductor cable, it doesn't really help us in the withstand, which is really eliminating or preventing, you know, an event from uh, resulting in any sort of damage. Where it really does shine, though, is when it comes into recovery. So as we just kind of talked about a minute ago, the ability to share capacity that you have at one station with a, an adjacent station at a distribution level provides you a pathway to recovering that station uh, and picking up load that you would normally not have had. And then the survivability is, you know, the ability to maintain some basic level of electric function. Again, because you are now taking your design uh, at a distribution level beyond the transmission level of an N minus one or an N minus two, you are increasing not only your recoverability, but then your survivability in that because you'll have alternative uh, discrete paths. So as we kind of look at where superconductor fits, in the resiliency landscape that's out there, it really fits that recover and survive um, perspective. So Mike, why don't you uh, give a little bit of the, the, the benefits or a little bit of what we're doing with Reagan in uh, Chicago. Right, right. So there, the, uh, the project that we're currently uh, executing with ComEd is in uh, two phases. Uh, the second phase, which um, which still has some approvals to go through before we get to it, is the is a large project which would involve uh, interconnecting three substations together uh, in the downtown Chicago uh, Central Business District in the uh, in the downtown loop of Chicago. Um, the, what we're trying to do with this project is that there are there are two substations that are 69 kV substations in this area that are, are technically radial uh, substations. Uh, they are served by, by um, multiple circuits, so there, there's 69 kV and I believe there's four circuits uh, serving each of those substations, but all four of those circuits are from a common source. So from uh, one single substation, there are four 69 kV lines uh, going to serve each of these two substations. And, uh, and what that does is it creates a, a little bit of a, a reliability challenge because if you had a problem at that source substation um, or a, a major problem on the right of way between the two substations, uh, it, it is possible to, to lose that 69 kV substation. So uh, because they're served in this radial manner, they're considered a little less reliable and resilient than some of the other substations on on Chicago's uh, in Chicago system, uh, one of those is is a third the third substation in our project, which is a 138 kV substation that does have multiple sources, um, so it's a much more reliable um, substation. And and so what we're going to try to do is interconnect the two substations that are a little less 
uh, lower on the reliability um, uh, criteria with one that is much higher on the reliability cre- uh, criteria and in that way lift the reliability of all three. Um, so what we're trying to do is basically take uh, what is currently an, an N-2 kind of um, reliability level and bring that up to an N minus three level reliability, meaning that you can, whereas previously you could lose any two circuits on the system and not uh, experience an outage, we're trying to get to a situation where you can lose any three components and uh, and not lose any outages. Now the, that can be done uh, with conventional solutions, but what uh, Comet has asked and expects out of this technology is to be able to achieve that reliability improvement without any new high voltage transformation uh, because of the space that that takes up, uh, avoid major infrastructure projects to try to avoid disruption to the to the good people of Chicago, and then uh, and really try to avoid any land acquisition or for substation expansion, because obviously procuring land in any transmission project in an urban area is very expensive and also creates a lot of challenges and, and public relations uh, difficulties and, and so on. Uh, the next slide, I believe, gives a yeah, little bit. Before we get to that one, Mike, so that I just want to hit on the, the second to the last bullet point, the significant infrastructure construction. So we will be doing uh, infrastructure. We'll put in a new conduit package in. But as Mike kind of teed up earlier in the in our talk, the, the size of the duct package that has to go in is much smaller than what would be required for either transmission or conventional distribution. The other real advantage this has is the thermal aspects or the lack of thermal aspects that Superconductor provides. So while we may have right-of-way space in the city streets of Chicago to put in another, you know, 16, 24 duct bank conduit package, the issue you run into is it likely it's going to be very near an existing conduit that we have. So now you have the thermal transfers between the new conduit package and the existing and the potential derating of existing cables that you have on your system. Where with superconductor going in, because it doesn't dissipate any thermal to it, there is no potential derate risk with any existing conduit package. And, and that along with um, you know other infrastructure that might be in the ground if, if you have an area where you have steam running through uh, um, your your territory and you're looking to put this in, the cable doesn't absorb heat as, as much as it doesn't give off heat. So it really provides some advantages for closer proximity to existing infrastructure without any impact. And that's, again, that's a, that's a huge uh, advantage when you get into really dense urban built up streets that have a lot of congested uh, other utilities that exist in them. Yeah, that, thank you, Dan. Uh, so just as a, as a graphical representation of, um, of uh, what we just said, uh, here is uh, what the project, the, the second phase of the project would look like. Um, so station A and station B are the 69 kV uh, radial stations, and, uh, and station C is the uh, 138 kV looped station. And the, uh, the idea is to simply interconnect those stations together at the distribution level, which is 12 kV in uh, in Chicago, and uh, and the uh, power rating uh, of the cables that will do that interconnecting is uh, 82 MVA, uh, sorry 62 MVA, which is approximately 3,000 amps um, at 12 kV. Um, so 3,000 amps at 12 kV, as as Dan mentioned, would require a, a, a large number of of uh, copper cables or conventional cables uh, that would take up uh, a bit more. Uh, infrastructure space. So before we get to this project, uh, we, we are currently executing and in the process of installing a uh, initial project. Um, the purpose of the project is to um, solve a, a reliability challenge at uh, a, a nearby substation in Chicago called the Northwest Substation, while at the same time giving ComEd uh, a level of uh, experience and, and comfort uh, with the technology uh, before we move into the larger project. So uh, the smaller project um, 
is uh, using the same equipment. Um, it's uh, demonstrating the same similar techniques and and uh, and showing how we would execute the project in the in the downtown area in a uh, a smaller and, and somewhat more controlled environment. Um, the project is a will be a permanent part of the system. It's not a, a demonstration project or, or anything like that. It is a permanent will be a permanent part of this substation for for many years. And uh, the basic idea is to try to uh, loop together a uh, a 12 kV uh, existing bus and uh, create a uh, another path around that bus so that in the event there's an outages uh, in the 12 kV system that uh, there's another path uh, to move power around the substation and to uh, avoid um, um, outage uh, conditions. So uh, that uh, project obviously will be um, uh, part of the experience and, and we'll, we'll learn some lessons as we're, we're working with ComEd and in installing the project and uh, we'll take those lessons and incorporate them into the uh, proposed uh, uh, larger project in the Central Business District. Uh, the next slide just gives a little bit of an overview of what we're doing. Um, and we're running a, a 12 kV cable of, of identical design as the, the cable that will go into the, the downtown area uh, from one end of the substation to the other. And, uh, and as part of that project, we'll also be demonstrating, demonstrating a splice. Dan, did you have any other comments about... Uh, yeah, really, that's, that, that is it. It's, this is being done um, while it provides um, resiliency advantages um, in uh, it, it, this particular station connecting two terminal buildings together. Um, we did. We, we intentionally put the project, designed it to do, a, to do a splice, to really look for the lessons learned, understand the technology, understand the the challenges, understand the design considerations that need to be um, factored in to a potential future CBD project so that you know, if and when that project goes forward, it's uh, we're much more educated and aware um, and the design is done, you know, right the first time and not, you know, minimizing a lot of the field kind of changes and issues that could come up. Um, this being a very controlled environment in an existing substation gives us some some latitude that if we have and run into some issues, um, you know, we learn from them uh, and we're not learning from them while we have a hole open in the city streets of Chicago. Right. Yeah. Another major aspect is we'll be um, demonstrating how we'll test the cable um, critical to utilities and especially with newer technologies is is having a test procedure, uh, both in the factory as well as on site, that um, uh, meets standards and, and is acceptable to the utilities. It's a, a major part of this project is to, to make sure that uh, everyone's comfortable with the test procedures that we'll use in larger projects. And, uh, and there'll be uh, many, many aspects of this project that we will, we will learn on. So, when you when you look at you know the viability, so as we've talked a little bit through the the talk today, you know new um, substations bringing capacity into a city location, similar to what was done at S in S in Germany, um, you locate where you have the ability to put. Um, expansion of existing stations or you may already have a large enough station to put additional capacity of, in transformation and then bring that power a uh, high transfer of power into the city where you connect in at just a uh, a breaker position you know that's a viable solution today uh, and there have been utilities that have looked at this and have come up with that being actually the low cost solution uh, for them today, and it really is um, offsetting a massive uh, cost component associated with land acquisition in a dense urban built-up area. There's some potential, you know, viable future solutions. You know, replacing existing low-pressure fluid-filled or high-pressure fluid-filled cables. Um, you know, those in the industry in transmission know the challenges with high-pressure fluid-filled cables. Um, 
and the long-term viability of, of, of that is, you know, a little bit questionable um, with having one manufacturer left really producing cables like that and really no new high-pressure fluid-filled cable uh, products being put in the ground uh, as we go forward. It's all XLPE. So how, at some point, how do you replace high-pressure fluid fill? Well, this could be a replacement option um, for some of those. It's, uh, it's, it's an alternative that still needs to be looked at. Um, you've already got existing footprint normally in stations where you had pumping plants to support the high-pressure fluid fill that could be potentially retrofitted or converted to cryogenic footprints, so the land acquisition piece may already be somewhat solved, um, you know, directly competing against the XLPE. So that is kind of the bread and butter for transmission for new installations is XLPE cable. Um, but XLPE cable doesn't have the same uh, transfer capability that high pressure fluid fills could have, especially if it's refrigerated uh, fluid. Um, and then ultimately, real visionary, it's directly competing against new overhead installations. So uh, for those, again, in the industry that look to put in any new overhead transmission line, um, especially if it's in a, uh, a virgin area where you don't have any existing facilities, uh, there is a lot of opposition to uh, installing new overhead lines. Um, a, in a area where you don't have any, there's enough opposition already where you are putting additional lines uh, adjacent to existing. Uh, but if it's a new area, uh, it's a it's a real big challenge. And so does this technology provide uh, a way to get the high transfer capability that you need um, on an underground installation? You know, so that's really the the as I look at it for a vision for this technology, that's what we should be shooting for. Uh, I, I use the example, uh, and Mike always loves it when I do this. Think back many, many years ago, the VHS quarters when they first came out. I mean, you could buy one, but it was like $2,000 for a VHS recorder. As the industry finally took off and that became the standard and Sona, Sony Betamax, you know, fell away, you know, VHS recorders were really, really inexpensive. And today you kind of get them thrown in free when you buy certain DVD players, but you almost can't buy a VHS tape because it's, you know, it's old technology. That's the hope here is that as more and more people look at this superconducting technology, find the right uh, application, start deploying it, um, the, the cost will come down as VHS tape players came down and will make this more of a, a mainstream. So the issues you've got to overcome, and it really the very first one uh, is total cost of ownership. Uh, and that's the way you've got to look at and, and these projects is what is really the total cost of ownership. There's a lot of discussion around the initial capitalization costs around cable. Let's bring the cost of cable down um, to where it's more competitive with traditional, I'll say, XLPE cable. Uh, and while that will come, I believe, as more and more um, utilization of the cable would come, just like my analogy with a VHS tape player, you also have to focus on the cryogenics. Um, the cryogenic plants um, and what those are on the initial cost installation, the civil work, the savings that you have on civil work compared to uh, putting in conventional civil, just in cement costs alone, let alone um, the scale of the, uh, of the trench that you need to open up. But really the, the key is what is the, and I just put a 40 year, you can put whatever duration you want, but what is the 40 year cost of ownership of this technology? And you really have to factor in the ongoing maintenance costs, which capitalization up front is, is maybe one challenge, but really ongoing O&M is another. So we go back to like the cryogenic plant, you know, are there some 
improvements in technology of cryogenics that will extend your O and M cycle or your your operating costs out to where you're you're say do a major overhaul every you know five years or ten years versus annually is just an example. Um, so that's the way you have to kind of look at this. Um, you know, competition is XLPE and pipe type. Not so much pipe type in in terms of new installs, but pipe type in terms of transfer capability. Um, and XLP really is the is your direct competitor to to putting this in today. Um, and then really the operational risks and challenges that that I kind of see out there from a visionary standpoint is, you know, cryogenics. Okay, so there's your single point of failure. So you've got to have redundancy built in, so that the cable always has cooling um, to maintain that superconductivity state and have that high transfer capability. Um, it's a new technology hurdle, and so it's part of the reason that we're doing the Northwest project that we're doing to start with is to learn and understand it. It's not something that uh, is known, as I said at the very lead-in uh, of our talk today. This is the third permanent install of this technology in the world. Uh, there have been many, many R&D pilots and trials that were used and run for a little while and then decommissioned. But this is the third permanent install uh, that exists in the world, the only one in the U.S. that's a, that's envisioned to be a permanent install. Again, there have been other pilots in the U.S., but none of them are still functioning today. Um, so worker safety. You know, we introduced liquid nitrogen, although it's a major component of air, it's at a cooled state. There's, you know, the worker safety aspect of that that needs to be just worked through. The uh, And Mike mentioned this a little bit um, more from a siting standpoint, but community acceptance of liquid nitrogen running through city streets in conduit packages. You know, again, we don't see that being a, a insurmountable challenge, but it's an education piece that you need to be proactive in having the right outreach to uh, inform and educate uh, your community leaders before um, it comes to them, you know, from other avenues. And then, you know, a little bit of uncertainty, the operational life. So what really is the operational life of this, of this cable? We, we envision to be like conventional cable, but again, it's, it's one of the things we need to understand. So that kind of really, you know, from a utility perspective gives a little bit of the the vision and the challenges that I see with the technology, um, it's new. Um, it has a lot of uh, advantages that we see, um, but we need uh, um, to learn more, which is what, why we're doing the pilot. And so with that. Just a couple of, couple of thoughts on that, uh, uh, Dan. Yeah, on the, uh, on the cost side of things, uh, yeah, with, with all new products as you improve the uh, the volume and the and the scale of projects costs come down but for, from a manufacturer's perspective as well uh, the initial projects are a bit more expensive because uh, we want them to be successful and there's a tendency to um, add levels of uh, redundancy you know belts and suspenders and and make sure that especially in a in a bellwether and high visibility city like chicago it's important that these projects are very successful so we have, a, you know, we'll have a tendency to, to definitely make sure that we do as much as we can to make it successful. And as we do projects, we begin to, we will begin to understand on how to better optimize uh, the technology in terms of cost. And and uh, and there's no no better way to do that than to just do it and and to start doing these projects. Uh, the, the the other thought is, um, we, the way our with our society today there is a lot of push to move away from fossil fuels and move towards uh, more reliance on the electric grid, whether we're talking about cars and, and electric vehicles. Uh, in Massachusetts, they just announced that, um, AMSC is based in Massachusetts, we just announced that uh, in 2035 that uh, gasoline-powered cars will no longer be sold uh, in, in the state of Massachusetts, and a similar things occurring in California. Uh, those, that power's gotta come from somewhere. And it's going to come from the grid, and you're going to have more and more reliance. Uh, there's more emphasis on, uh, on heating, uh, moving away from natural gas and oil, particularly here in New England, 
um, and moving on to electrifying heating. Um, all of that adds load and, and to, to the grid, and uh, that inf that's going to be infrastructure that's going to need to be installed. And it, we all know it's not going to become easier over time to install more power lines and transmission cables and things like that. So the, the market forces, um, I believe, are, are pushing the industry in the direction of, of this type of, of technology. Are, are there ancillary studies after installation, like performance, magnetic field, temperature, performance, what happens under short circuit conditions, things like that. Are there planned studies that will be conducted after after startup? Yes. So the um, the project at Northwest is heavily um, um, metered, heavily uh, monitored. Um, so more more so than we would in a in a typical project, so to speak. Um, so pressures, uh, temperatures, uh, uh, flow rates, you know, all, all of the sorts of things that um, that are critical to understanding how the device performs during unexpected events um, are are going to be carefully carefully monitored. Um, as a general rule, don't most utilities do not simulate. Uh, transmission level faults on their system and, and things like that. That's just kind of a, that's what we do in labs. We don't do that in, in, in the real world. Uh, but if they happen and we want to be watching carefully so that when uh, a fault does occur uh, on the system, whether on the trans, on the superconductor cable or on the somewhere else on the rest of the grid, uh, that we're able to carefully see what happened and, and how the product reacts and, and so on. Um, aside from that, we do have a uh, fairly uh, extensive uh, test procedure, um, acceptance procedure that's based on um, standards. Um, so CGRAY and IEC the, um, have, have standards, so to speak, uh, for superconductor cables. Uh, IEEE is working uh, on, a, on, a, on a standard, um, and all of, uh, all of this will follow those existing standards and help inform the IEEE standards as well. Okay, um, I think we're just about getting to the end. Anything you want to add, um, Dan, or are you are you all set? No, I think I'm good. Thank you, Paul. Okay, well, it was very interesting. There was one thing I was I was thinking as um, as you were presenting, Dan, the right away um, phenomenon and not having an impact on the adjacent infrastructure within the the city itself. It must. Um, it would mean that there'd be a lot less study work also, a lot less thermal impact studies, um, maybe magnetic field studies and things like that as you were doing a plan to maybe install that phase two. It would, it would lead to less study work and a potential cost savings there also. Potentially, yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to um, head over to a question screen uh, for a few minutes, uh, review the questions, and we're going to bring uh, Mike and Dan back on to, uh, to answer your questions in detail. And uh, we have lots of questions. Before getting our questions, uh, I see a lot of things in the chat box about the PDH contact hour certificate. Uh, send an email to paul.stedrick at nepsy.com or matt.marset at nepsy.com. They are the two emails that you want to send it to. Please send it only to one of us, not both of us. That way we're not, uh, we're not duplicating our efforts. Um, if you need to contact Michael of Ross, uh, you can do that at mike.ross.amsc.com about superconducting cable and uh, the technology and the use of it. So we're going to go to the question screen. We're going to get uh, Dan and Mike back on the screen to answer your questions. And um, so I'm just going to read through and, uh, and uh, Mike and Dan, please uh, pipe in and answer the questions as we move along. So we had a, a question from Chase Sun. And the question is, what is the cost of superconducting approach relative to the conventional approaches? Is there a break even load slash capacity level above which superconducting cable approach may be cost effective? Yeah, I mean, uh, all the uh, 
projects that we invest, uh, investigate, we're looking to be competitive uh, with the conventional solutions that are that are available to the uh, to the utility. The uh, projects are, are evaluated on a project by project basis. We're trying to uh, uh, you know use these uh, smart materials and and uh, these technologies to become uh, competitive uh, with the existing equipment, both in terms of uh, uh, performance and 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 other aspects. And I would just add that, you know, it's, I mean, as I use my VHS example, I mean, it's early. This is the third project in the world. So uh, as this technology gets adopted broader and broader, the cost will come down and the, the competitiveness curve point will, uh, will come in reach. Okay, we have a question from Sergio. What voltage classes uh, are these cables being used on? Yeah, uh, the project in Chicago is uh, is at 12 kV or, or 15 kV class. Uh, in the United States, we've done projects up to uh, 138 kV uh, de demonstration projects in uh, Long Island. Uh, higher voltage projects have been done uh, in other countries. Um, so there there's a very wide variety of um, of uh, voltages and applications uh, of the technology. All right, we got a question in regards um, to the pressure. What is the pressure of the coolant inside the cable? Oh, that, so that's a uh, that's a design parameter. Uh, so as uh, you go to higher pressures, the uh, liquid nitrogen can be cooled to lower temperatures. So higher pressure equals the opportunity to go to lower temperatures. Uh, the superconductor material. Uh, as you go to lower temperatures, its ability to carry current uh, increases uh, substantially. So you get about 10% more current capability for every degree Celsius colder you get. Um, so there's a fairly complicated optimization uh, process where you, you look at uh, the cost of the material, the cost to operate at different pressure levels, uh, the cost to cool to different levels and you come up with an optimized solution that uh, that combines all of those things. Uh, but the, the, the pressures can be in the 15 bar kind of kind of neighborhood, give or take five bar. And a bar is an atmosphere, right? Is that correct? Yeah, okay. Um, a ground, uh, so uh, Jack has a question about ground, but uh, then he follows up with capacity to handle fault currents. Oh, so, yeah, so the, the, the cables are designed to handle uh, uh, fault current. Um, the, uh, and, I, and I noticed that there were a couple other questions that have popped up about, um, you know, in high levels of fault current through the cable connecting substations and that sort of thing. Uh, one of the technical details of the cable that we didn't get into a lot of, uh, a lot in this particular presentation that you can uh, find more detail in Tech Talk 31 uh, is the fact that the cables have a, a certain amount of fault current limiting uh, capability. Um, and again, it's it's a little it's a detailed topic. Um, I, I would would advise anyone interested in that to to dig into it in the uh, in the uh, uh, Tech Talk 31. Uh, as far as grounds go, uh, the cable has a neutral. Um, there's a copper neutral that runs uh, on the outside of the superconductor portion of the cable that's there to carry uh, unbalanced current and and to a certain degree uh, unbalanced fault current. Uh, that is also bonded to the uh, cryostat, so the the metal parts of the cooling of the um, uh, thermos bottle, the uh, the insulating uh, cryostat, uh, also makes up uh, part of the ground. All right. There's a question in regards from Tim Tim Ricard asked a question about is the conductive material proprietary? Uh, the material itself, uh, you, so you can Google the material. Um, we use a, a material called uh, YBCO, which is uh, based on, on yttrium. Uh, there are a variety of different types of, uh, of superconducting material that are made by different manufacturers. Uh, the material itself um, was developed uh, in the US, I believe uh, IBM. Uh, discovered the material back in uh, uh, 1984, uh, somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, and uh, the the uh, material itself uh, is not what, what you would call proprietary. But the turning that material into a product that can be used in cables and and other applications uh, that that's the the challenging part, and and that's uh, that's what we're working hard at uh, learning to do better and better over here. 
All right. Uh, we have another question from uh, Ying Ying Hao, I guess is how to pronounce the name. Does liquid nitrogen need to be refilled or any kind of maintenance? How to perform that? Usually, what's the frequency for such work? Yeah, the uh, the liquid nitrogen in a in a project in Chicago's project it is completely closed loop. Um, so the liquid nitrogen is not uh, uh, lost. That uh, doesn't need to be uh, refilled in any large amount. There are, you know, small amounts of uh, of lost in some of the portions that is that is um, replaced in it at lower, small quantities. But for the most part, uh, it's a completely closed loop system, and uh, the uh, the liquid nitrogen is is run through the cable. It picks up the heat uh, heat along the cable. Goes to our cooler, is cooled back down, and then then recirculated. What was the second part of that question? Well, I think there's. Um... So, so okay. like maybe, yeah, so... maybe describe maybe describe the open. The S in Germany is actually an open system. Absolutely. So there's another uh, uh, cooling approach which uh, uh, involves uh, instead of using a, a, a cryo coolers, instead of using electricity uh, to run a machine to cool the cable. We can use um, a, a tank of liquid nitrogen. Um, so in those those types of projects are considered open loop. So you have a tank. Uh, that tank is um, you usually have a contract with a supplier of liquid nitrogen, air gas, prax air, Lindy, uh, you know, one of those folks, and uh, they uh, keep the tank full, and the system will consume the liquid nitrogen uh, in order to keep the uh, the cable cold. Um, so that's uh, a different approach um, in urban areas. Generally, you know, trying to find a location for a, a liquid nitrogen tank and getting access to it for a, uh, for a, a truck is not not usually very convenient. Um, so uh, for a project uh, like what we're doing with Dan here, we're using the closed loop approach. So maybe it's worth me just asking a question: What well, if you spring a leak or you run out of nitrogen? It's good. It might be in people's minds there also. Mm -hmm. In an open loop uh, configuration, uh, yeah. so yeah, it, so the liquid nitrogen is necessary, and and uh, if there is a failure in that system, um, that's uh, severe enough that we can't keep the cable at its operating temperature, we do have to take it offline. Um, we're very aware of that problem, and uh, we take a variety of steps to introduce the appropriate amount of redundancy uh, to to achieve our availability goals, meet our warranty requirements. Okay. Maybe you want to comment about uh, the cable accessories, terminations, and joints, if you can comment on that. Sure, sure. So, so uh, AMSC, we have um, we we manufacture the, uh, the 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 material, the superconductor material, and that's uh, a tremendous amount of uh, of our intellectual property and our uh, our capability of uh, of making that that wire. The the big part of the value that we bring to these projects is. In that that raw material, uh, also in the designs and the in the relationships with our customers and, and so on, uh, for for the actual manufacture of the cable itself, there, there's really not a, a lot that's special in the manufacturing of the cable. It's it's fairly it uses conventional cable manufacturing machines. It uses cable uh, conventional um, uh, uh, insulating materials and, and things like that. Uh, so we partner with uh, cable manufacturers to to turn uh, the the, uh, the proprietary uh, uh, manufactured uh, superconductor wire uh, into the the superconductor cable. Um, so those um, those cable manufacturers are subcontractors to us, so to speak. Uh, in in addition to making the cables, they also uh, make the um, the, uh, the splices and the termination. So, uh, whatever uh, subcontractor we would use for the cable uh, would also be the supplier of the terminations and the joints. And, uh, and on our project that we're doing in Northwest, um, with respect to the terminations, they can be either horizontally mounted or vertically. We're actually doing one of each again on this whole journey of uh, similar to doing the, the manhole and the splice is to learn and understand uh, because. Your design considerations when you start to deploy this, you know, it may dictate to you that you don't have the space for a horizontal term and you need to do a vertical termination. And so we're testing both of those out in this application as well. Uh, we have a question about the maximum length. What's the uh, maximum possible length for the cable? Sure. So, so like uh, conventional cables, 
Uh, superconductor cables do have um, a characteristic called charging or capacitance. Um, and with conventional cables and with superconductor cables, uh, that is a feature that, that drives the uh, limitations on the length. Uh, higher the voltage, the, the shorter the maximum length. Uh, but for the applications that we're envisioning in, in urban areas with a medium voltage cable, uh, we don't even come close to uh, reaching the, the maximum lengths uh, of the cables. It's uh, uh, not, a, not, a, not a critical point. Uh, the one thing to think about is the, the pumping of the liquid nitrogen. I know there's a question in there about um, extra pumping stations and so on. So, so you, you can, uh, different designs will allow you to cool and pump from one location. Uh, there's other uh, options to spread the cooling and the, the pumping out to multiple locations. Um, just depending on the project, we, we work with the customer to design the optimized approach to, to meet the operating needs. Okay, uh, Edward brings up a point about paralleling the secondaries of the distribution substations. You have an increased fault current. Uh, I think you have a good answer for it. So I'll let you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Again, uh, this this is this aspect of this uh, you know unique and incredibly valuable feature of these cables that they have this ability to mitigate fault current and, and manage fault current. Um, and again, the the uh, the function behind that is a little complicated, but I do. Uh, cover that in Tech Talk 31. Okay, great. Okay. Um, next question. Getting down the list here. What kind of warranty do you offer? I'm also interested in maintenance requirements. Yeah. For uh, you know, warranty is a, uh, you know, that's a commercial relationship with, with uh, each individual customer and, and we, uh, uh, we understand their, their needs and concerns and we, we, uh, come, we work with them to come up with the appropriate warranty uh, for, for the, each project. Uh, maintenance, uh, so there is maintenance on the closed loop systems on the cooling uh, system. The, the cable itself and terminations and joints are essentially maintenance free. Um, and uh, and there's a lot of advantage there. Uh, the cooling system does involve moving moving parts, um, but it's all conventional off-the-shelf uh, refrigeration systems. So these are things that uh, uh, various suppliers are available. Uh, they can provide uh, maintenance services, uh, and uh, in time, when when utilities become more comfortable and, and use this equipment more often, uh, the ability to train uh, utility personnel to perform their own maintenance is, is something that we envision. All right. Uh, uh, Antonio Campana had a question and also a statement, I think. Uh, you mentioned connecting the substations together and did not uh, need transformation. Is it a huge energy savings uh, as you do not need uh, the magnetics and you will have a huge energy savings? Dan, you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not only energy savings, it's really cost savings. Um, Again, I mean, you're connecting a cable, in our particular case, at 12 kV. It's a breaker position. That's all you need to basically invest in to be able to connect at both ends of the station, you know, either station end. Um, the alternatives are, um, you know, whether it's conventional cable and you've got really more of the civil, the install aspect, or transmission transformation, which, you know, you know the cost. Uh, of what a, a single transformer uh, would mean at a at a station. So that's really where your your really your big savings are. It's the real estate, it's the transformation. It's not required, uh, and it's just a simple breaker position. Okay, Dale Scott brings up uh, what happens when a cable faults. Is isolating the fault and restoring operation have a difference versus the status quo, probably versus normal cable, and does um, does the higher energy per cable result in any specific concerns? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, the the, uh, the question about the higher power per cable, uh, the answer there is no. Um, you know, utilities um, have the ability to purchase uh, breakers and, and equipment uh, conventionally at, at the 3,000 and 4,000 amp level. Um, Fairly, you know, many suppliers supply that sort of equipment, so that, that's not too big of a deal. Uh, on the protection side, uh, the the cables uh, generally will 
it, it's a little complicated. So I, I mentioned about the uh, the fault current limiting aspect of the, of the cables, and uh, that characteristic does uh, require you to avoid certain types of relays, such as distance and mo and um, and impedance type relays, and instead use a differential uh, type protection methods. Uh, all can all types of protections that utilities are very uh, familiar with. Uh, so uh, in general, the protection of the, of the cable is is typical in terms of uh, faults. Uh, we do have extra uh, protection on the cable to watching things like um, the, the, the temperature of the cable, pressures, flow rates, that sort of thing to make sure that everything's operating uh, in a healthy way. And uh, so there are protection components that make sure that uh, we don't get out of those specs. All right, Mohammed uh, had I think a repeat question, but but uh, he also mentions LN2. What is LN2 and operating temperature? Not sure what LN2 is. Maybe you do. Uh, and also, yes. did you design uh, it to be fault current limiting cable? And if so, how can you limit the fault current? Yeah, yeah. So it, it, the uh, uh, LN2 is liquid nitrogen. Oh, um, okay. And the uh, liquid nitrogen. Uh, is, is um, operating at uh, kind of typical liquid nitrogen temperatures under pressure. So it's uh, 70 degrees Kelvin, uh, give or take a few degrees, depending on the, the system. Uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, and then as far as the fall current limiting bit, again, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, direct people back to Tech Talk if you want to understand that fairly complicated aspect of the cable. All right, uh, Mohammed. again, another question. What level and type of redundancy did you consider for the HTS cable project? Any conventional cable as part of the redundancy in the system? Uh, you want to take that one, Dan? Yeah, so, I mean, in terms of this, really the redundancy is more on the, which I've mentioned earlier in the talk, is around really the cryogenics. It's maintaining uh, reliability to keep the cooling of the cable. It's a single cable. Uh, so there's not redundancy in the cable, and there's not, uh, I'll say, parallel, you know, redundancy with conventional cable. All right. Uh, so it was a uh, Amit uh, had a question. Can we use some part of it in a conventional running project? Uh, so maybe a system that's got already cable in it. Maybe perhaps is the question. Can you sub in superconducting portion of it? I think maybe it's a question. Yeah, yeah. So um, one thing that we've seen is uh, there's an existing cable. Uh, that cable may be running through a uh, environmentally sensitive area. Sorry, uh, an overhead line or a cable uh, may be running through an environmentally sensitive area, and there may be a desire to um, to take that overhead line and put it underground. Um, and uh, you know, get, get it out of the way. There's there's a lot of concern nowadays with things like. Uh, uh, you know, fires in California. Um, uh, in general, the public is is I think pushing the utility industry to do more underground and, and less overhead uh, in general. Um, and and there are places where superconductor cables could play a role to allow a existing overhead line to uh, dip underground in in whole or in parts. Uh, Dan, I don't know if you had any thoughts on yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would say is, I mean, you think about, which unfortunately we didn't have a picture of it in this presentation, uh, but the termination. I mean, the termination has three phase blades that you connect to uh, on either end. So it, you know, from a plug and play type component and in integrating into any type of system, whether it's overhead lines coming in uh, through, you know, a connection to those, through other underground cables that would run up and connect to those. I mean, it certainly can be connected in. It's it's a phase blade, you know, one per one per phase on each each of the terminations, and that's how you connect it into your system. Okay, and uh, Derek Barlow, bending rays limitations uh, versus conventional cable. Yeah. Uh, so the, the the cable can be designed to different bending radiuses. So it, it does uh, it is provided on a standard uh, cable reel. I think they're uh, a 12.4 foot uh, diameter uh, cable reel. Um, so uh, the bending radius is tight is tighter than what's needed to um, to go on a reel like that. Uh, in general, it's it's convention it's uh, uh, comparable to conventional cables. Um, like conventional cables, there's a difference between uh, the bending radius that you pull through versus 
uh, you know, one time bending at the end to turn into a, a, a accessory, a, a joint or a splice. Um, in, in general, it's very typical to conventional. Okay, I think uh, that is all the glut. We got one more question just hopped in. Uh, what is the diameter of the cable? What about the uh, what about the insulation used? Um, specific to the the uh, Comet project, uh, it's a uh, I believe it's a nine nine and change inch um, yeah. diameter. The uh, the diameter is also one of those design parameters. So uh, you know, keeping in mind that we're we're trying to optimize a a fluid dynamics problem. You know, we're, we're trying to pump liquid nitrogen through this cable. Um, so, you know, you can think of it as a, a larger hose uh, allows you to go to different distances and, and operate at different pressures and, and so on. Um, so depending on the application, uh, there are a lot of uh, interest in using these cables in existing ducts. So a lot of utilities have four, six, and eight inch ducts uh, running in their system. Sometimes they're spare, sometimes they're equipment that they'd like to replace. Um, so we can work with our cable partners uh, on designs to fit in um, smaller ducts. Um, and then for, for projects where it's a little bit more greenfield, uh, we can open up that parameter and uh, use it to optimize other aspects of the project. So uh, nine, nine and a quarter inches or so in, in Chicago, but that is by no means um, a fixed requirement of the cable. Also, if it's uh, three phase versus single phase, right? And where your nitrogen return is, right? It would be the other two determining factors. Yeah, yeah. Not not to get into too much detail, but in in general, at the, at higher voltages, like uh, like 138 kV, uh, we would split it into three single phase cables. Uh, the the three in one design that we were looking at. Or is really more for a distribution design cable because of the insulation from phase to phase. Uh, it does get a little thick when you when you get to higher voltages. Um, but we can also take the uh, distribution cables and break that into single phase cable. Um, so if we had a challenge that uh, involved uh, four inch ducts, for example, um, a very small duct, uh, designs are available that break a 15 kV class cable into single phase cables that can fit in four inch ducts. All right, and Paul has a good question about the uh, replacing fluid-filled cables uh, and reusing those with pipes uh, for this. Uh, is that possible? That is a primary application that we're excited about. Uh, Dan, maybe I should let you chat about that. Yeah, I mean, it is. I mean, so that's that, you know, you've already got, a, whether it's a six-inch, eight-inch pipe, you know, that is your conduit. So you, you clearly can pull superconductor cable through. Um, you know, I will say the one design change you think through is the high pressure fluid filled is a generally a 138, 345, in my case, um, voltage cable that would then at the other end go to a transformer that would transform it down to your distribution voltage. Um, so it would actually potentially maybe save you some transformation uh, in a redesign in the future. Uh, again, freeing up some additional real estate that you might need for the cryogenics that's that's required uh, once you remove the pumping plant facilities and the transformation. Because if it if you're running at a distribution voltage class level, um, it, it will go straight into a breaker. If you're running a transmission voltage class level through that, um, then yes, you'd still need your transformation. Hmm, okay. Um, Peter Belkin asked, can it be used for DC applications? Yes, yes, we, we uh, uh, our cable partners, again, uh, do have uh, HVDC uh, cable designs. Um, I believe there is a plus or minus 80 kV uh, superconductor cable that's been demonstrated uh, uh, in, uh, in other countries. And... Uh, so we can, uh, so yes, uh, HVDC is, is a possibility. At the low voltage side, uh, we, we do see great application for this technology. Now, now we're talking about more industrials um, when we're talking about uh, data centers that possibly could use 48 volt uh, pow DC power at very, very high currents or the uh, uh, aluminum smelting industry or the, uh, the uh, uh, water desalination. Is a is another one where uh, low voltage cables at uh, at very high currents uh, in in DC 
um, had some, some very interesting applications and possibilities. Maybe uh, electro weaning, chlorine, uh, those those processes too are low 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 voltage but very high current. Um, right. What about offshore wind? Is there have you any consideration there for offshore wind projects? Yeah, that's a, that's that's a really big topic in the industry. Um, as the as the entire industry is moving to these large offshore wind farms, you know, thousands of megawatts, you know, many multiple gigawatt uh, offshore wind, um, you know, the the, the key places uh, in the North Sea now, uh, where where huge amounts of of offshore wind is going in, and uh, there's a great debate uh, in the industry about AC versus DC. Uh, in those applications, there are many who feel that uh, that HVDC uh, offshore is a, a tremendous uh, way, uh, tremendous advantage in, in in expanding and allowing those types of uh, farms to grow. Uh, and there are organizations uh, in the U.S. and in Europe that are actively um, exploring how to use superconductor cables in those types of applications. Um, it's a uh, you know a, a bit down the road, but uh, but there's there's great promise for for HVDC networks uh, in the uh, in the offshore world. Okay, Paul Paul uh, had a question, and I think we'll hit him with it, and then we'll have him come back, and maybe answer uh, type something else into the chat box. But he he mentioned four thousand amps per conductor in the power cable. Is that like a a hundred megawatts of power? and uh, how many high voltage cables are replaced by one superconducting cable. So Paul, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to come back, but it requires a uh, voltage, that question, to answer that question requires a voltage. We, the, the megawatts is calculated 4,000, which is 4KA, times the square root of three, times the line to line voltage. So we need the voltage to answer the question, but maybe you wanna comment, uh, Mike. Yeah, I, um, I believe we showed in the slide that uh, at 3,000 amps at uh, 12 kV is was it 62 MVA? Oh, 62 MVA. Yeah. 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 So you you can uh, you can scale the math from there. Right. Okay. And uh, last question from Peter: the triax for this project rather than three single phase cables? Question mark. Yeah. Uh, the the triax design has um, some really uh, interesting benefits. Uh, it really is. A design that that optimizes the amount of material. Um, so, with a triax design, uh, we're able to 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 just just make the cable as compact as as possible. When you go to the uh, to the other designs, to three in one and and so on, um, you're having to incorporate uh, multiple layers of because you're going to have a shield around every cable no matter what. So you have to insulate between the, the insulator and the shield. Uh, if you have three separate cables, you have three separate insulators through three separate shields, and, and the diameter of the cable grows, which means the cryostat grows, which means uh, more heat losses, which means more cooling. So, so when, you, when you're trying to run through all of these optimization designs, uh, you quickly find that uh, uh, if the voltage allows it, the triax design is, is really a superior design. Okay, I think that just about uh, covers all the questions. Uh, so we're we're gonna end the uh, presentation now. Um, Mike and Dan, I do appreciate you coming on and sharing this technology. It's exciting new technology. I I think to uh, to continue to spread throughout the industry. I appreciate you coming on to discuss it. Great, Great. thank you, Paul. All right. Uh, and I'm going to flip over to uh, the next the next Tech Talk. Tech Talk 34 uh, will be Thursday, January 14th. So next Thursday, 2 p.m. Same format. Uh, it will be just myself this time. And we're going to be talking about harmonic filters. Remember, NEPC is a manufacturer of medium voltage metal closed harmonic filter systems. And we're going to be talking about filter design flexibility. How to design uh, filters to have flexibility. And this is an important matter because systems do change and having the ability to change the filter is very important. So uh, that will be next week's Tech Talk. I appreciate everybody coming on. We broke 200 today, which is uh, a record for us, 200 listeners at once. So we do appreciate everybody coming on to uh, watch this Tech Talk. Thank you and Happy New Year.